Yes, here. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the live Q&A webinar that we have with our four fabulous photographers that are going to be joining us this summer on Madeline Island, uh, June 17th to June 21st. Um, it is with big popular demand that we have welcomed these guys back. Um, a couple of them are joining us again. And then Jerry and Sue are new to us. Um, and we are thrilled to have you all with us. Um, this is one of a few webinars we have done recently um, with you guys. We've done sort of what's in my bag, what am I going to pack, the last one we did where we introduced everyone. But this one is focusing more on um, our students and potential people that want to join this, um, this retreat. And they have some questions going into this retreat. We're going to do sort of a question and answer type uh, webinar with the four of you today. Uh, my name is Annie Sumner, and I am the director at Madeline Island School of the Arts. And behind me, you can see our Madeline Island campus. Um, just to give you some backdrop, we started this flagship campus about 12 years ago and have since opened other locations throughout the United States. Um, I'm not going to go into that today. Um, certainly visit our website, www.madlinschool.com, and um, check it out. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to get the ball rolling here uh, with some questions. We do ask that you utilize, if you're joining us, the chat box to tell us about yourselves. Obviously, thank you for telling us where you're from. And ask questions to our instructors. For the next 60 minutes, we'll dive into anything that you have on your mind that you want to ask. When you're asking a question, please specify who you'd like your question to go to. Um, just to give you a backdrop of what this five-day retreat is, you'll learn a variety of a wide variety of techniques from these four masks photographers. They specialize in macro, close-up, and abstract imagery during this retreat on Madeline Island. Utilizing the picturesque environment of Madeline Island and our historic port town of Bayfield, um, they will be able to capture more than 50,000 blossoming florals, um, a vivid mosaic of roadside lupin, fingers crossed they're in bloom at the time, island gardens, um, and woodland plant life. Um, there is also a nearby antique recycling facility. It's a really nice way of saying a junkyard um, mm -hmm. with abstract opportunities that will be available also. Um, the retreat will experience a combination of shooting in the field. Um, there'll be classroom lectures and there'll also be this unique post-processing training where they utilize spe specialized software. Um, Ample time to get personalized hands, personalized hands-on, one-on-one instruction from each one of these masters in their field. And without further ado, I'm going to start off this question and answers. Um, and I'm going to start. I uh, think uh, you guys let me know who you want to answer this. But I'm going to ask, what draws you to a flower and garden photography, and what kinds of locations work really well for this type of? Um, this type of photography. Go ahead. You guys can fight amongst yourselves as to who's going to answer that one. Let the ladies go first. Yeah. Oh my Do, God. Jerry. Why don't you guys go first? Okay, I'll I'll take it on. Um, well, for me, I, you know, I can shoot in just about any location where there's flower, a flower or several flowers. And I actually set up my own backyard to shoot all summer long, um, and I live in a very small little ranch house with not a huge yard, and I've been planting since we moved into this home, which was coming up on four years now. We used to live in four acres, so I had, you know, a plethora of areas to plant, but you know what I started doing? Planting my flowers in pots for a couple reasons. My dog, <laughs> was number one getting into my flower beds but he's gotten over that now he's a he's four now but the other reason is pots I can sort of jam everything together and move the pots around in a different direction I use fairly large plot pots I can deadhead everything easily all summer long and I can shoot all summer long like that but I also love botanical gardens because they have things I can't grow and wide open spaces and the opportunity for beautiful backgrounds at a distance. 
And so I get to pull out different lenses and try different things. And that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about going to Madeline Island is we're going to have sort of a little bit of everything. And I'm really looking forward to different types of photography, which I'm like a bokeh freak. So I shoot with a lot of vintage lenses and lens babies. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, who's next? Who wants to go next? I'll go next. Well, like Jerry says, really, all you need is a flower or two and you can be happy pretty much anywhere. Um, I do a lot of macro photography, so I'm in there really close up with whatever flower I'm looking at. And so long as I can exclude the background, it doesn't matter if the flower is in a garden or in a busy street. Um, so long as I'm in there close up with the flower. Um, but it's always nicer to be somewhere natural. Obviously, it kind of gives you the right feel and the right vibe. Uh, one of my favorite places in the world um, are the Swiss Alps in midsummer, where I go up and find wildflowers and snow covered mountain peaks. Uh, and I start skipping around like, you know, something from Sound of Music. <laughs> um, I also love flowers against water, which we may have opportunity for in Madeline Island, I'm hoping. And fields of wildflowers are one of the things I love best, just that kind of expanse of flowers growing wild. So I'm I'm very much looking forward to seeing the lupins um, on Madeline Island. I'm tightly keeping my fingers crossed for those. And Charles, what about it, you? Yeah, so I will echo everything that Jerry and Sue said. Love lots of color. Um, just give me one flower and I could spend an hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, it's amazing uh, the opportunities for macro on Madeline Island, as well as what I like to call, of course, the intimate landscapes where you can do things with multiple exposures and intentional camera movement and more abstract type photography. So we'll be looking at the small details and the, the little bit wider picture also. So, um, and like Jerry, I too used to have a, a backyard with all kinds of flowers and really appreciate being able to move them around, putting things in pots you can control subject distance background and all of that so much better um, but we'll still manage and there's some beautiful amazing gardens um, not only Madeline Island there we might even take the ferry back over to Bayfield and check out some of the private gardens over there too Mike um, I always teach about finding character and what I look for when I go into a field say like the lupin, like you see, Charles has got a nice group of lupin, lupin right behind him there. Um, <laughs> when I go into the lupin field, I will look for uh, a particular flower that is a little bit unique or different from all the others, because you'll you'll find 99.9% .9 of them will look the same, but I'm looking for that fraction, that 1% that is a little bit unique or different, has a little sh different shape to it. Um, and, and so I, I, that's what I tend to look for is, is, uh, the flowers that have some character to them, something a little bit different. Wonderful. Thank you, you guys. I appreciate that. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, for Charles and others that might have input. Um, Diane is asking her Nikon D850, does the 10 images multi-exposure and stacks in camera? Um, she's currently updated to Olymp to an Olympus and only does the two image stacking. Her question is, is there a workaround either post-processing ideas to achieve this effect? Did I ask that correctly? You did. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, I You want me to answer that? Diane, I think, directed it to everybody, but I'll be glad to jump in because that uh, is near and dear to me. I have a split personality at the moment. I'm using a Nikon and an Olympus. I can't let go of the Nikon because of the ability to do the in-camera focus stacking, but I love my Olympus for many other reasons, including all of the in-camera focus stacking and other features that it does. But anyway, um, actually, there is a workaround where you can do more than two in the Olympus in the camera itself, but it's very, very tedious where you have to keep using this image overlay feature. You would take two and then overlay it with another and then you'd have three and then you overlay those three with another one and then you have four it's very very tedious so i still have my nikon <laughs> because it's so much easier but if you don't have a nikon anymore and you just are shooting with a camera that does no multiple exposures or two as few as two like the olympus 
you can use, uh, there's a, a free script or action uh, that is a plugin to Photoshop. And it's on my website, actually, um, charlesneedlephoto.com. And you can download that script and be able to do it in a more automated fashion. But the way you shoot it is exactly the same, whether you have it in camera or not. Anybody else want to touch on that at all? No, I don't do uh, multiple exposures, but I would like to learn. So you're going to have to teach me. It's fun. On my nightgown yeah. when I get up there. For sure. <laughs> Highly addictive. Yeah. And don't I forget the I... phone. I mean, I'll be talking for those who want to learn about yeah. iPhone photography yeah. or Android. You know, we can touch on it a little bit. Um, there are apps that do it, you know, up to 120 photos wow. stacked onto one image. Wow. So, yeah, we could cover that, too. But. I would add, I shoot with a Nikon D750, and that only has three, you can do up to three multiples. So uh, my older camera, I think I could do, my older Nikon, I think I could do five. But you know what, for me personally, because I play around with it a little bit here and there, I have found that two and three are perfect for me. So I never really want to go past mm -hmm. that too much. And I guess if I did, I might consider doing that and then doing a couple more and may, maybe going in Photoshop and overlaying. Charles, you could. Sure, you could. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. But I find two and three are perfect. Three is really good too, both two or three for me. But, yeah. you know. And the Orton effect too, getting a blur with something sharp. Exactly. Sharks. That works great for that. Yeah. I, I really enjoy listening to all of you feel like we're always teaching each other and learning from each other. It's fascinating. Oh, sure. This is sort of the, the, the luxury of having four fabulous instructors. Um, everyone has their specialties. It's, it's a really unique, unique thing. Um, I have a question for you, Jerry, um, from Scott. He loves the lens baby edge 35 mm -hmm. using focus peaking he can move the slice of focus around, but he's having trouble changing the angle of the slice of focus. Any suggestions? Okay, by angle. And Scott, I think I know exactly who you are. I got, <laughs> <laughs> he's one of my, one of my, he moved to North Carolina, if it's a Scott I'm thinking of. And he's actually one of my old shooting friends here. And, and I miss you so much, Scott, if that's you. And if it's not, I'd like to meet you too, if you're a different Scott. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I would say the edge, first of all, the edge is, I feel the most, <laughs> I hate to say this, edgy, um, actually um lens that they have um so it's it's a it's very um i i find it really great with architecture and things that 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 are um cityscapes and things like that it's a little more challenging with flowers or close up flowers so i tend to use it more on landscapes or something that's set back like that so what the edge does for those of you that don't know is it allows you to place a slice of focus in your image. And I think what Scott's trying to say is that he's having trouble moving that slice to way, maybe where he wants it. And you do that by tilting the lens. You actually tilt the lens itself. It's on a ball sort of um, thing that you can lock and unlock and move the lens. So um, yes, it can be challenging. I think it is the most challenging lens maybe that there is which makes me want to play with it even more. And I think the more you use it, the better you get. And the thing you have to keep in mind with it is that the wider open that you use it, then the the let your 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 slice is is going to be harder to find and move than when you maybe go, I'm talking like F28 compared to say F five, six, you're going to have um, a bigger slice and easier to see. So I would probably change or try messing with the f-stops, but that that's what I would do. And then tilt the lens. And people tend to over tilt when they get these kinds of lenses. And that so a little tilt goes a long way, I would say. Those are two tips I would give. Wow. Thank you for your inside information. That's helpful. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I have Trisha from New Hampshire. Um, I hope that helped, Scott. Um, I have Trisha from New Hampshire. Her question is that um, 
for those of that of them who want to learn ICM but have never done it, where do we start? How do you know how fast to move the camera or which direction to move it? I'm sure you just have to practice to get good at it, but just want some pointers on where to begin. Okay, well, I'll jump in on that one because I enjoy ICM a lot. Um, and the answer to your question is how long is a piece of string really? Because <laughs> it all depends on what your subject is, the distance between you and your subject, how fast or slowly you personally move the camera. But as a rule of thumb, I would start off looking at something around an eighth of a second. Take a few at an eighth of a second, look at the back of your camera. If it's an indecipherable blur, then you need a faster shutter speed. If it still looks too real, then you need a slower shutter speed. But it's very, very experimental ICM. And you need to take, don't like take six pictures and look and think, oh, I can't do it. You need to take a lot of pictures, a lot. And even for someone that's been doing it for years and years, you still have a lot of trash ones um, because it's so, so variable. It's almost impossible to take the same one twice. Um, but I think, yes, I don't know what you others think, but for me, an eighth of a second is a, is a fairly good starting point for most subjects. Yes, I would agree, Sue. Absolutely. That was a great way to describe it, too. <laughs> How long is this piece of string? <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope that was helpful. Um, Claudia loves using the Lens Baby lenses and would like recommendations on the best lens to use on a Fuji film camera with an APS sensor. She has the Velvet 56 and 84 and also has the Sol 45. However, she'd appreciate anyone's thoughts because she's opening to purchase additional Lens Baby lenses. Who wants to take that one? Probably Jerry. Okay, Jerry, you're the so, queen. You <laughs> so she has the 56, the Velvet 56, did you say? And, and, and 85. 85. And okay. The SOL 45. The SOL 45. Okay, well, jackpot on all three of those, okay? <laughs> so, um, and people often actually ask me, the biggest, one of the biggest questions, I get two questions all the time, which, if they're not a lens baby person, what lens baby should I buy, Right. Um, and that's kind of a multifaceted answer. And the other one is, I want a velvet. Which one do I get? So I always tell people, and those questions could probably both have the same answer. What do you like to shoot? I mean, we're talking about a flower um, conference here, you know, abstract and all of that. So any of those lenses are going to work really well. I shoot a lot of garden photography, and but I also shoot flowers. And the, my other favorite thing is still life. I do a lot of still life. So for me, um, I love my 85 velvet for flowers, gardens. It gives you that beautiful compression and the backgrounds are like phenomenal. And I think when that lens came out, it was like the flower lens of Lens Baby for um for photographers, for flower photographers. But I like the 56 too, because it's kind of in the middle. I can go to a garden and I can do a small scene. I can use it for my still life photography, which I do. I use half and half. I use a, my 56 a lot for that. And they both have macro capability. So she's looking for something else. And I would suggest to her because she's got the Soul 45. And that is one of those little um, lens babies. It's a great entry lens. It's one of their cheapest lenses. And if you're not familiar with the lens baby, it's going to give you so much fun. And it's got a couple different little fun options on it. And I always recommend that for, for people that are new and want to get into lens baby, because they call it a sweet spot lens, kind of like we were talking about the edge before you can tilt this thing. So tilt it and place it wherever you go. So she's looking for something new. I would recommend to her the double glass two, which they came out with maybe about a year and a half ago. I got to beta test that. And that would give her just sort of complement what she has. It has a sweet spot, but it's got a lot of different things, more options to it than just the Soul 45. So I would I would recommend that that particular one for her. Super. Thank you, Jerry. That's really helpful. Um, I do have uh, a question for, um, I don't know, maybe Mike can, 
Mary Beth uh, is asking, she lives on the beautiful Bainbridge Island um, and they have a fair amount of gray and drizzly weather there. Um, she often needs to shoot indoors. What devices or lights do you use for interior macro botanicals? I, I, I use the natural light. I, I don't use any lighting systems, no flash. Uh, Even uh, when it's overcast and dark outside? Oh, I love it. Really? Wow. <laughs> I would prefer shooting on a cloudy overcast day. Um, sure. If it's sunny out, I'm gonna be diffusing that subject. Um, so I always shoot with natural light. I, on occasion, will use a little LED light to light up an area of a subject that might have little, you know, like under exposed in a certain area of a flower or whatever, the bottom of a flower that's not getting as enough light, but that's really rare. I mean, that's real rare when I do that. But um, personally me, uh, I never use any type of light even in my home when i'm shooting i just use whatever natural lights available i i really enjoy natural light most of the time also um, i just got back from atlanta and we did a three-day indoor macro uh workshop there were no windows there were a few doors and we used some of the natural light coming in that way but i do enjoy when i am indoors sometimes not all the time most of the time i'll shoot without it but um the little uh, lytra things or the luma cube lights they're really powerful and they have a little diffuser dome that you can put over it and depending on how close or far you hold it from the subject those can be helpful for supplemental lighting and i could totally relate to the bainbridge island thing i lived on in seattle for 20 years and uh i remember when they would talk about you know two two minute or two second sun breaks and same in the uk sue right absolutely yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's what the best the weather for flower yeah. photography. Yeah, yeah. When I get up in the morning and it's sunny out. I'm not going out that day. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you're lucky to live in that climate. Oh, I wish I had cloudy days. The one, the one other thing I would also use, and I totally agree about using natural light inside. I always do. But I've got a little reflector, which I can use. So if the windows say on the right hand side of my plant or flower, I'll put the reflector on the left hand side to just bounce a bit of that light back in good idea yeah yeah i shoot on my stairway um i have a, a stairs that goes um where in, in through a two-story high foyer in the front of the house has a huge window and it floods that stairway with natural light so i have light that kind of wraps itself around the flowers but like sue said if you're next to a big window then you have this directional light coming in um so you're only getting one half maybe lit up so like she says you can use that reflector to bounce it back mm -hmm. onto the other side I would add one thing too. I'm with you, Mike, all of you. I shoot all winter long here in Buffalo because it's Buffalo, okay? <laughs> and we have snow everywhere. And honestly, I found out, and I never noticed this, this year I was shooting, I pull a table up, small table up next to my window, set things up on a table. And the actually, the like you say, the overcast light is even better. And you would be shocked how much light comes through a window. You might not think there is. If you, and I'm shoot, I tend to shoot wide open. So my lens is wide open. It's going to let all that light in. And I can get away with shooting handheld that way through window light as well. So um, I've, I, I experiment all, all winter long with it. And big tip here. Trader Joe's, two words, Trader <laughs> Joe's for flowers. I don't know what I would do without them. They came to town here about five years ago. And I swear, it's like my favorite place to go for food and flowers. But but they have gorgeous flowers for not much money. And I'm there all winter long bringing stuff home and keeps me busy. Free <laughs> plug for Trader Joe's. Well done. I hope you're <laughs> Um, for Mike, um, we have a question for you. I have a lot of questions. We're going to get through these. For Mike, I prefer sharp focus. Adrian prefers sharp focus to lens baby. What's your best tip for photographers to get sharp focus and bokeh? I've been experimenting, experimenting with my iPhone 13 in addition to my Sony, which is better for sharp focus. So this person has not obviously followed me. Um, because I use backgrounds behind my subjects, so I eliminate the clutter that's behind. Uh, so all my shots are done with backgrounds, many that I've created myself, and some you can actually buy. But uh, I shoot at uh, f32, and that gives me maximum depth of field. Now, most photographers would tell you never shoot over f16, 
but I've been doing this for 20 years and uh, I get every part of the flower, everything in focus completely. Uh, there is one issue, of course, with shooting an F32 is the aperture being so small. It's uh, going to cause some diffraction because the light, as it bends through that little opening, uh, it, it causes a softness in the details of the subject. But the software companies have provided with us with sharpening programs. And I use those sharpening programs to create the sharpness in my image. Uh, and it's amazing how well it works. But uh, yeah, that's how I do it. I can go literally to a botanical garden and, and set my f-stop at f32 and shoot the whole day at f32. Never change it. But I, I have to use backgrounds behind the subject because otherwise I would bring all that clutter in focus behind it and it would ruin the shot. So that is, it's a simple style that I've used for the last, you know, I, years ago, I used to do it naturally without backgrounds, but you'd have to find a flower with a background that was far enough away to help blur it out. But you couldn't shoot at F32, obviously, so you'd bring that background in. But the, the problem is like in botanical gardens, because everything is so packed together so tightly that you can't find a flower with a background 10, 15 feet away to blur out. It's very difficult. And then some people will say, well, you could focus stack. Well, focus stacking is not, to me, is not as easy as people tend to let you think it is. Um, <laughs> if, if you're shooting in wind, windy conditions like we are a lot of times, well, pretty tough to focus stack that. But um, yeah, the F32 will get everything in focus for me. But again, I'm using a background behind there to eliminate the clutter. Thank you, Mike. That was helpful. The great thing about this group here is that everybody does something a little bit different or actually a lot different, really. <laughs> I'm sure none of these others are doing F32, but that's a good thing because then you get to see the different perspectives. Charles does something totally different. Sue does something and Jerry, they all do. We all do something totally different. That's the great thing about the workshop is that you're exposing people to totally different styles of shooting. Yeah. Totally agree and with that. Yes. On the subject of focus stacking, real quick, Mike, um, I agree with you until I got the Olympus. And as far <laughs> as I know, it's the only camera out there now on the market that will do in-camera focus stacking and then combine it in the camera. Yeah. Um, you do end up with a JPEG, but I used that in my Gardens of England tour last year, and I was blown away. You know, you can shoot things at about 5.6, even if it's slightly windy. I mean, obviously, you want to wait for the wind to die down. Yeah. Just hit that little button and it'll do the eight slices and combine them all together. I mean, it's not always perfect, but um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So yeah, because Tom and Lisa I fell in love with had, that. But Tom and Lisa and we can the, play uh, with that on Madeline Island a lot too. If yeah, anybody they wants. they had the same system that you do, I believe. Tom and Lisa, they were there last right. year. Yeah, and they were using it the uh, in in camera focus stacking, right. and I believe other cameras are coming out with that now too. Yeah, I mean, a lot of cameras will do it, but I don't know of any other one that will actually render the result in the camera, in the camera. on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And Charles, most of that that script of stacking is on your website, right? It is. Yeah, there's like a resources tab that you go to and it's right there. It'll say multiple exposure scripts. Yeah, yeah that sounds like Susan Bailey had downloaded that. And yeah, it's... thank you, Susan. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, Susan. <laughs> I haven't seen her yet. I know, right? <laughs> Mike and I know Susan very well. Yeah. Oh, it's so fun. Thanks for joining us, Susan, supporting <laughs> these fellows. Um, Sue, so I, I have a question from Marlene Newsom. She wants to know, what's your lens of choice? Well, my favorite lens is I've had for about 25 years, I think. Um, it's an, a Nikon 105 millimeter macro. And it was made in the days when nobody had thought of vibration reduction. Um, so it's a very simple lens. It's got, it does have autofocus as well as manual, but I tend to use it on manual focus. Um, and that's the one I use most of all. Well, I say most of all, probably 99.5% of the time. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a lovely lens and I don't know what I'm going to do when it finally gives up the ghost, but it's <laughs> small, it's lightweight. It, uh, it focuses with pin sharpness. Um, it has a lovely wide aperture so that you can throw your background right out of focus, which is something that appeals to me a lot. Um, and it's absolutely great. Nikon also make a 55, I think it is, and a 200. Um, so the 105 is the mid range of those. And if you're only going to buy one macro lens, that's the one I think is the most versatile to go for. I agree. 
Uh, Lorraine from Cape Cod has a Raynox, a Raynox MSN-502, which is a macroscopic lens. She brought one, she brought the wrong one years ago and it just picked up the Raynox 150, 1 1.5X after a visit to Longwood Gardens. What do you recommend she practices with the 150? Who wants to answer that one? Jerry, you use the Raynox. I, I have it. the Raynox. I've had mine, probably the original one, and I think it has the 1.5, which she's talking about. The one I have has a little squeezy thing that will fit on the front of your lens. It's like got springs and you push it and it yeah. just kind of attaches so it'll fit to several. You don't have to use like step rings with it. It's kind of cool little thing. Um, it'll get you super close. Um, so, I mean, putting it on a macro, like a dedicated macro lens, you're going to get ultra, ultra close. But what, so I don't use it like that anymore. I'm using it on some of my lens babies, which, um, you know, like the, whichever one I pick, you know, my, my smaller lens baby lenses that aren't, don't have macro capability. I'll, I'll use that. And it gets me really, really close for very, very kind of dreamy if I'm using it wide open. And when you practice with that, one little thing that um, you're going to use all manual focus, one little tip with that is put your arms next to your side when you're using it and you've got your camera. And once you sort of attain focus, you know, um, you're kind of in the ballpark at whatever you're trying to pick up on on your flower, which let's say it's a tulip and you want that stamen just in focus and you're going for that. Once you get it in the ballpark, move your camera, your body actually in and out before you hit the shutter button. Trying to keep focusing back and forth can be frustrating. Once you get it in the ballpark, Keep your finger on that shutter button and just kind of move or rock your camera ever so slightly because you're magnified pretty huge with those, believe it or not. And they're a fun little thing. You can stick it in your pocket. They're not huge. That's wonderful. Thank you for your help with that question, Jerry. What I'm loving is everyone is piping in on the chat, webinar chat, telling us about what's working for them and how much they love their certain cameras and their lenses. So thank you so much, you guys. This has been helpful for everyone. I have some more questions, um, specifically uh, pertaining to um, what to pack for this retreat. I know we had said what's in your suitcase, but are there recommendations for clothing and footwear? Um, Bob wants to know. Um, he He's specifically asking you guys or potentially if there are people that are on this webinar that have been on a retreat, what has worked for you and what hasn't worked for you in terms of clothing? I Anything? would say layers for yeah. sure. You know, yeah. to be cool in the mornings and the evening yeah. and, um, you know, pants that you can tuck into your socks. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, there tend to be ticks around in the summer, but that's not a problem. And then, um, yeah, as far as clothing, that's really what I would. Yeah. At the top, off the top of my head, sturdy shoes, you know, something for the sun, um, a hat sunscreen, all that sort of usual Bug stuff. spray. Bug spray, yeah. Bug spray, yeah. I would say if you get a hat, you don't have one and you're looking to get one, get one that has the drawstring thing under it so that you can, I have a, a one, I think it's an Adidas um, and it's got the vents in it and I love it. If the brim isn't so huge that it gets in the way of my shooting, but I can put it on and put the drawstring up so it's not flying off my head. And one other tip, I'm going to give you this because I went to Arizona last year for a, a, a flower conference, a desert flower. And boy, I thought I'm going to get me a new spiffy pair of sneakers, you know, and, and my husband said, oh, you got to get these. And my daughter said, you got to get these. And they're wonderful. And they're wonderful. Couldn't find them in the store. And I ordered them online, put them on. They were great. Walked around the neighborhood with them. Got to Arizona. Don't buy new sneakers and wear them. Buy something that's kind of worn in a little bit that you know are not going to hurt your feet. <laughs> Those were yeah, useful for me. Another yeah. thing I just thought of was knee pads. You know, yes. you might not think Definitely about that, but that's knee always pads. helpful, especially in a public garden if it's paved. Yeah. That's yeah. always, or even not paved. You'd be amazed how many more shots you're willing to get if you know your knees are going to be 
yeah. comforted in some way. And there's some <laughs> wooded areas that we shoot in and there'll tend to be some mosquitoes. So if you want to bring a, a net for your head, like a, a mosquito net that you can put over your head, that's helpful too. Mike and Jerry, Sue and Charles, when you're traveling with your gear um, for, and your tripods and things like that, what kind of pack do you use? Do you do you check it? Do you bring it on the plane with you? How do you pack all your gear? This is a great question because we all probably have different answers. Mm -hmm. Oh, Who I'd wants love to go you. first. You go, Charles. Oh, well, um, I always take the head off my tripod and put that in my carry on. Because if the bag were lost, I can always replace the tripod head. And then I do check the legs. I have, you know, a traveler tripod, carbon fiber, fairly lightweight. Um, and then I have, uh, I really love the um, backpacks made by, oh, I can't remember, uh, Mind Shift, I think it is, M-I-N-D-S-H-I-F-T. It's a very well thought out backpack. They come in three different sizes. Um, so that's, I'm a big fan of that. And then you can also bring a roller bag. You know, I do that if I'm going to England or anywhere in Europe next week, I go to the Netherlands. So yeah, that's what I'll bring to bring all the gear over, but then I'll have a secondary bag just to hold a few lenses when I'm in the field. How about you, Sue, since you asked me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I tend to check my whole tripod. I take the head off the legs, but I put it all in my check-in bag simply because my camera bag that I'm carrying on is just doesn't have space for that. Um, and I get the biggest camera bag I can that complies with the airline uh, requirements. Fortunately, they usually specify size and not weight. Um, if they specified weight, that would be a problem. So I carry my incredibly heavy camera bag as if it weighs nothing over my shoulder and, and then generally have to ask someone to help me put it up in the locker overhead. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I put all the precious stuff I keep with me for sure. Um, if my tripod goes missing, I can always hope handheld for a few days, but I don't want to lose any of my camera gear on the way. Um, so yeah, and then in the little bit of space that's left, I pack a few clothes. Hmm. Priorities of the camera stuff always. <laughs> what about you jerry um well um i have a roller bag that i took when i went to arizona with me so i wanted that with me i wasn't going to check that in no way and i'm like you i took my tr my tripod head off and then I, but i put the the tripod itself in my suitcase so, um, and my tripod is um one that I had just gotten about a year ago. It's a Vanguard Alta Pro 263 CT and it's carbon fiber. I absolutely love this tripod. The arm goes down, you know, for macro shots, like straight down, whatever. And it's not super heavy, but I packed that in my suitcase, but I'm going to be driving here. So I'm probably going to bring more than I need. But I think the good thing about this conference is it's going to be I think you're not going to have to pack tons and tons and tons of lenses because we're going to be specific with macro and maybe a zoom lens that you like. And um, of course me, I got to bring all my lens babies. My babies are all coming with me <laughs> and then my vintage lenses. So that's, that's my, my issue as far as lenses. If I didn't shoot with those, I think I'd be pared down quite a bit, but yeah, all my Meyer optics and my my um you know vintage my um Helios lenses they're all coming with me. Which anyone that has an adapter shoots Nikon can borrow them when we're at the conference and feel free to use them. And um they're super super fun. And I'm the same with the other three. I pull my head off my tripod, put it in my camera bag, and then the tripod goes in my check bag with my clothing. And um, that's how I carry my camera bag and a laptop bag and with my laptop and that goes on the, on the plane. But you don't wanna leave your head in the, with the tripod in the check-in because right. if someone steals that tripod, you lose your head too. And my head yeah. is more expensive. <laughs> we don't wanna lose our head. <laughs> and I use the same tripod that Jerry uses, it's the Vanguard, excellent tripod. Love it. Um, we have a question from Alda. She was asking if it's useful to bring mucking boots, muddy fields, et cetera. And if we have any issues with poisonous snakes on the island, 
Yikes. No, definitely no poisonous snakes on the island. I'm fairly <laughs> certain. Too cold. Up um, and she was wondering what lenses other than macro. I think you just answered that, uh, Jerry, um, are recommended, right? No, I mean, you guys are really just, really just going to be doing macro and oh, also abstract. But do they, they, medium they, telephoto would be great for doing a lot yes. of the multiple yeah. exposure yeah. and ICM stuff. I love my 70 to 200 yeah. lens for that. And if it's got a foot on it, even better. And with a, a collar, um, even better. Okay. My lenses are, I care. I, I don't even really use my my macro lens anymore. Um, I'm using my zoom lenses, which is an 18 to 300 and 18 to 400 from Tamron. And they will focus down to an inch and a half by two and a half inches. So um, I don't really carry my macro lens much anymore. It's just the zoom. Well, that's helpful. Um, Charles, uh, Scott can only do two images of multiple exposures in camera in camera on the Olympus. He took your advice and got the AVG Cam Pro software for his iPhone. Can you talk some about how this software, can you talk about how to use this software a little bit more in depth? The AVG. Yeah, so um, I'm looking at it right here. Uh, thanks for that question, Scott. And I usually vacillate between four or eight um, images so you basically tap the settings button and then it'll bring up three options for you and it's how many pictures you want to overlay so i'll usually choose four or eight then you know the interval which is the time between those shots usually i do a second but if i'm doing kind of this uh whole pep ventosa type thing i'll choose more than a second so i have time to walk around whatever my tree is or vertical subject um, and then the the pre-start timer is the last setting, which is basically how much time before it starts shooting. So once you have those three things set, you just hit the shutter button and experiment. And just like Sue had said, you have to take a lot of photos. Um, you know, somebody once told me the difference between a professional photographer and an amateur photographer is that the pro has a bigger trash can. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> That's what you're doing is trashing a lot of images before you get one or two, you know, that you just fall in love with. And the immediate feedback is excellent, you know, with digital to be able to with film. We had no idea what we were getting until you got it back from the lab. So it's great. Lots of fun. And even if you don't think you're going to use that much, it's the best two dollars you've ever spent <laughs> to <laughs> download that app. It's called Average Camera Pro. And uh, unfortunately, it's not available for Android, but there is an equivalent. I don't know it off the top of my head, but if somebody wants to email me, I could tell you what it is. So um, hopefully that's helped. That was helpful. I have some other questions. Um, with regards to this workshop um, on the island, um, Will they be carrying their camera and a few lenses with us most of the time, or will they go back to their room and change their lenses when they want them? Just wondering if they should be bringing a small bag that will carry a few lenses in addition to the large bag that will carry all of the equipment while traveling. What should you? What do you recommend? Well, I think each speaker in the morning or the evening before you know who you're going to go with because you'll you'll have a schedule and you'll know who's going to be um with you on each day and you can contact that that uh that instructor the evening before and say what do i need to bring now for me personally i don't have people bring a ton of different types of lenses uh usually i'll just say well you have this lens or this lens bring that one because i know basically what we're going to shoot when we go to that location so you can just check with your instructor but um the others may require you to bring more lenses to do more things. So what do you guys think? Bigger bigger bag or smaller bag? I would well, say- I think, Oh, go ahead. Hands. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, am no, I am no photographer in your field, but I would, I mean, would you suggest having them bring all of their lenses and then a smaller bag for each day? Or you maybe could, but we'll be pretty close to the car, I think, most of the time. Yeah. So- you know, you could go back to the car once we get to each specific location. Yeah, except when you go to the bay field. Well, then true, you, exactly. You With that, to, you'll have to do everything on there. foot. Yeah. yeah, but I think the instructor will be able to tell you what you're going to need the next day. They're going to, what? how many lenses you got? What lenses uh, did you bring? 
go, I'll bring this one, bring that one. I might say, just bring one lens. Um, but the others like Jerry, she's got, you know, lens babies and everybody has a whole series of lens babies. <laughs> I would say if they're with me I'm, and they have a lens baby and they're having issues with it or want more help with it, they definitely, for me, they would want to bring that particular lens yeah. in addition to the other things that they usually like to shoot flowers with or whatever. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I'm going to obviously have a big bag when I arrive, but I'm going to have a smaller bag that I take out with me. That's got the certain things that I know I'm going to be teaching or using. And I'm obviously going to have more than what they would need to bring. Do you have a baby carriage for those lens babies? <laughs> I need mean, actually I waiting I, for that question. That's a good that one. Is so funny. I need one, actually. Yeah, that would be good. Um, I actually have this really cool thing that I bought a couple of years ago, and I may bring it with me if I can fit it in my car and get it out there. And it's um forget what it's called. It's called a Raleigh and it's got these big tires on it. And it's supposedly, uh, we don't have beaches here, but you can take it out on the beach and it won't sink in sand. You can go over a little bit of rough terrain and I can pile all this stuff in it. I've been using it on trails and it's fabulous. Nice. Love it. Um, I have some other questions. Uh, has anyone ever, ex had anyone have experience with platypods? Platypod. Mm. Yeah, I've used the platypod. It's it's a flat um, base that you can set on a table or, and put your head on there, your, your ball head, and then touch your camera to. A lot of people use them indoors in their studios. Um, some will use them outside, but uh, um, I don't know. I don't find it very useful outside, but um, because it sits so low to the ground. It's hard to, uh, I mean, if you're shooting flowers that are very, very low to the ground, it works okay, but we generally aren't doing that in, in gardens. So When I did my workshop in Atlanta, we were using them. That's um, the Don Kamarechka setup. Oh, if yeah. you don't know Don, you got to yeah. know Don. He's the he mad scientist <laughs> who does snowflake photography, um, used to live in Canada. But anyway, yeah, you can use the articulating arms and do little macro setups with it. Yeah. indoors but like mike i don't really typically use mine in the field so much no. i would say if you're a mushroom shooter you'd yeah. want one for sure yeah that would help you out with that the the thing out in the field that is nice if you have the arm and you have the little elytra light you can attach it to the arm and direct it to a flower yeah. that's one thing that it would be useful for but like the tripod that jerry and i have you can literally put the camera right on the ground with that tripod I mean, it, you know, right. it, it'll extend, the legs will extend straight out. You can put the base of the tripod right on the ground. And then with the extension center post extended out, the ground, you know, you can shoot anything as low you want to the ground. But then you have the option of shooting low stuff plus high stuff. Right. You know, well, you, that's you a question everything. that someone else had. Do you always, Mike, shoot with macro flowers, macro flowers with a tripod, especially when you're shooting with an F32? Yes. Uh, I, well, I'm on I'm on a tripod because I'm shaky. I, I, I literally cannot hand hold a camera and get a sharp image. Okay. So I have to be on a tripod. But there are other people that shoot handheld and they do fine. But for me, I have to be on a tripod. Now, you may think because I'm shooting F32 that I've got long exposures and it's just not true. I'm shooting with the ISO at 2000 and I'm getting 1 30th of a second, 1 60th of a second. My, my shutter speeds are fine. And even in low light conditions, I can get fast enough shutter speed. So, but I have to be on a tripod because I'm too shaky to handhold. Now, I, I've had speakers at my macro conference that would come in and I, I had no idea, but they said, we shoot everything handheld. I go, wow, <laughs> I wouldn't have thought that. Um, but there are a lot of people do. I use a mix of tripod and handheld. It, it depends very much on the flowers. If it's a very low level of flower, I like to just lie down and brace myself on my elbows and make a kind of tripod with your elbows and hold the camera and you can be pretty steady like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can certainly get fast enough shutter speeds usually to handheld. Um, but the difficulty is that if you move a millimeter or two, you might lose your point of focus when your yeah. depth of field is very, very shallow. So if I'm on a higher flower, I do prefer to have it on a tripod if possible, just so that I can really fine tune the composition, 
make my point of focus exactly where I want it to be, not risk myself moving a smidge, especially if it's a kind of crouched over position. It's fine if it's head height, but if you're bending and trying to keep very, very still, it's not so easy. So I'll use a tripod where I can, but if it's difficult to get the tripod in position, then I'll then I'll handhold. I agree, Jerry. Same with me. I use a mix of both. Mm. Having been trained with film where you had to get it right in the camera, mm -hmm. the tripod was a good discipline and the yeah. cameras couldn't handle those higher ISOs back in the, the day then. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it, there's something very freeing though about not using it. And you yeah. can always compose off the tripod first and then get the tripod, which is a good practice too. For sure. Yeah. I tend, I tend to use... I tend not to use my tripod, believe it or not, hardly ever. Um, the the one time that I will use it, um, I uh, like I was mentioning earlier, I set up my house um, for flower shooting with pots. And one of my favorite times to go out and shoot is actually as the sun's going down. I love that low directional light. And it'll sometimes be almost like barely light out. And when I'm going to shoot in that situation, because I shoot a lot of moody uh, flower photography I might pull my tripod out for that but I'll tend to jack up my ISO because um the the software now can handle if it's a little bit over um and honestly I hardly ever use the most time I use my tripod is for my still life indoors so but I see a question here I kind of want to answer that someone asked me about because I get this question a lot they're asking tips for, um, Diane is asking tips for Helios, sharp subject focus, but still creating that lovely background effect on the reverse Helios. For those of you that don't know what a Helios is, a 44.2, it's this little lens. I pulled it up here and you can still find them. It's a vintage lens. You can find them pretty cheap on, on, um, when you go on eBay and other places like back in the day when I was buying mine, they were 40 bucks, you know, 35, 40 bucks. Now they're gotten popular and they're up a little bit. But this, this little lens that's inside of here or the front lens element, there's two little slots there that you can put this tool in there and twist it. The ring comes off. And you can reverse the front element. So normally the element is kind of like this. It's bowed out a little bit like a normal lens would be on some lenses. When you reverse it, it's now concave. And you're thinking, well, why would you want to do that? Because if you looked at any images taken with a reversed lens, you get this crazy sort of vortex sort of half moon kind of bokeh that swirls around. It swirls anyway, this lens does. It's known for its swirliness. So, um, but when you reverse it, the swirls go opposite, the opposite mm. way. And it's pretty cool, but she's right. It's really hard to focus. And I'm gonna have that lens with me. I've got two versions, one that's not reversed and one that's reversed. So I'm going to have that with me on Madeline Island. And this is going to be a fabulous place to shoot Lupin and get that crazy bokeh in the backgrounds and everything. But I always shoot it wide open, completely wide open. And you're, and the, the thing with that lens is it's only sharp in the very middle. Okay. And especially when you reverse it. So you have to be very mindful that what you're trying to put in focus is in the very center. So um, that's the first tip. And the other is I do that thing I explained before where I get it where I want it and then I barely rock that lens and I have my finger on the shutter ready to go. And it's it's like um, Sue and Charles have all been saying about taking a lot of images. You may need to take quite a few of them to get what you want. But isn't that the fun part of us being out there? Mm -hmm. I mean, really, this is a challenge and I'm going to get this and you will get one. I mean, you will, but we're going to do a lot of playing like that. And that's what's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you, Jerry. I'm going to take a couple more questions and then we have a slideshow. Um, so real quick, um, Jerry and Mike, what do you use on, what heads do you use on your uh, Vanguard tripods? Go ahead, Jerry. Jerry. 
Oh, I have an Acrotec ball head. I don't know which one it is, but it has kind of that open. Mike probably knows more the actual name, but I, I pretty much use what Mike, Mike recommended these things years ago and he was like spot on for macro. Years yeah. ago. Like, yes, years and years I've been following Mike. So. I enjoy the really right stuff. Uh, BH55 ball head, rock solid. Yeah, heavy yeah. duty. <laughs> yeah, it I is heavier the than the Acrotec. But yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> I have the Acrotec as well, and um, they've cut away the front forty-five degrees of the face, so it has the ability to move the camera in any position you need to go to. Or as a standard ball head, you have a U slot. You know, you work in. A um, little slower, but uh, yeah, and it's made out of aluminum, so it's super lightweight, and they've cut away all that big metal housing that a typical ball head house has, so it's very super lightweight, but uh, what I like is just the able being able to move the camera into any angle or position I need to go very simply, and it runs about 369, I think it is, so it's not a cheap head, I mean, it, right. but then it's, it's not as expensive as Charles's head. <laughs> right. yeah. Do you guys um all that wants to know, do you guys use auto shutter release? I use the self timer set at 10 seconds. Oh, interesting. Some people or use a the cable release. Okay. Yeah. You guys use cable releases? If I'm on a tripod. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't think anybody used those anymore. <laughs> I always thought they all had the wireless ones, you know, the little wireless ones. Well, yeah, there's, but that's like the garage door opener where you sometimes <laughs> can't even get it up, uh, I know. on fire. I know. I yes. tried them too. What a pain in the neck they were. Um, um, uh, last two. Jerry, can the Helios be used on Olympus or Micro 4, 4, 3, 4, yeah, 4 3? Sure can, because guess what? The Helios has an m42 mount the one that you want that's an old screw mount and so you need to get an m42 mount to whatever your camera is to use that lens so um i'm nikon so i have an m42 mount to nikon and it screws on the back of the helios and then it attaches to my camera so um yeah you you can use them on anything you just need the correct mount because that's an old vintage mount. I think it's an old Pentax screw mount that they don't even have anymore. So. What about um, dealing with grainy graininess at higher Iowa ISO? I have a Nikon D750 and anything over 200 isn't as clear. How and how do you deal with wind? Joe Smith wants to know. I got a D7500 and I <laughs> shoot at 2000. <laughs> well, nowadays, the post-processing noise reduction using AI is mind-blowing. It yeah. is. So, yeah. Topaz AI. Or all the even way. just Adobe. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Adobe, right. I don't see this. And there was a second involved. part to that question. I can't remember. How do you deal with wind? wind? Oh, yeah, wind. Sue, how do you deal with wind? Well, <laughs> It's not a very helpful answer, but I try not to go out when it's windy. <laughs> in general, if I if there's a garden I can go to any day I like, I keep an eye on the weather forecast. I go on a day when the wind is less than, say, eight miles per hour. But obviously, if you go to Madeline Island or anywhere else, you take the weather as it is. Yeah. Um, if it's windy, I would take a lot more exposures a lot more photographs to make sure that i got the one where the focus was where i wanted it to be like i said we won't we won't have trouble having a fast enough shutter speed but the flower might have moved in or out of our composition in or out of our plane of focus so i would just take a lot more photographs in that situation to make sure that one of them had the flower exactly where i wanted it to be yeah and i go out early in the morning when i'm shooting locally at the parks um uh, I, I look out in the morning, it's still dark out, I get up at five, and if the plants in my yard are still, and it's going to be an overcast day, then I'll get my gear, I'll drive to the park in the dark and get there right at daybreak, and I'll get an hour, hour and a half with no wind or low wind, yeah. and once that wind starts to pick up, then I'm heading back home, but like Sue said, if you're shooting in a garden, or on Madeline Island, and you're out in those lupin fields, then you just got to deal with whatever you got, <laughs> You and that's what it's great for ICM or multiple. Yes, exactly. I was going to say that. 
Just that go was, with the even, wind. Yeah. That's when you, Here, instead Eddie, of your camera moves, the subject moves the subject and you moves, let it yeah. do oh, its thing. Right. Yeah. Is right. that, when you're discussing, is that, is, they said, is there any room for burst mode when shooting macro, ICM, et cetera? Yes. Right? Well, you could do burst mode on, a, on when it's windy. Yeah. yeah. One, of the, one of the bursts mm -hmm. will uh, eventually catch it when it's still. <laughs> yeah. I don't really use it for ICM though, but that's an interesting idea. Something we could try. Yeah. Something to try on the island. Um, I right. I think that that is uh, most questions have been answered um, and we are coming up to about an hour here. We have a quick slideshow that we wanted to present um, just to wrap up this fabulous uh, Q&A. Just to let everyone know, this has been recorded. And if there are any additional questions, um, they can certainly um, email us and let us know, and we'll get those answered for you. Um, but going forward, I'm just going to go ahead and give you a, just a brief sort of description of what you're going to see uh, at this retreat on the island. It's just loading right now, I think. Uh, let's see. One person had asked if we are full and we are not. No, there are a few spots, Only a few left, spots left. Sign yeah. up. Absolutely. Um, I can can you see anything? No, it's loading still. Loading. Good old internet. <laughs> um You're not a, you're down in Santa Fe, right? Or I mean uh Tucson, right? No, I'm a, I'm down in Santa Fe. Oh, Santa Fe. Old Santa Fe. It's about 40 degrees here today, but the sun is shining. Here we go. All right. So I don't think it wants you to load it that way. All right. So we're just going to go through here um, and I'm going to just sort of explain what we're looking at. This first, oop. Hold on. Here we are. There's Charles. <laughs> All right. So what we're looking at here is, um, okay, hold on. Here we go. We'll start here. Um, this is Madeline Island School of the Arts, the campus. Um, it's just located about a mile from the ferry boat. And again, like I said, the workshop space, um, your accommodations, um, offices, barns, restaurant, everything that where you eat is all located on this campus. Beautiful, beautiful, um, wonderful space. Um, all right, next up, next image. This is a different view of the barn and so the workshop space. There we have on our right is the original windmill on the campus. Um, that big red barn is where the upstairs is one of the classrooms where you'll be looking at, you know, your exposures and photographs. Um, the building right in the middle is um, a large workshop space, two large workshop spaces that we also have available. And in the first floor of this barn on the left is um, where all your meals are served during the day. Next shot. This is a beautiful picture of uh, the milk house, which is one of the two classrooms where the workshops are um, are ho held each day. Um, wonderful natural light with the windows all around it. Um, and those, those kind of views in the evening are not uncommon. You get to see clouds and sunsets like that on the daily. Next image. This is inside the barn where all the meals are served each day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, wine is welcome at dinner every evening, as well as uh, multiple different conversations. We encourage people to change up their seating and, and meet, meet people each day. Um, again, the food is delicious. We can't stop talking about it. And we do um, cater to, to various different dietary and um, um, medical needs uh, during the meals. Uh, this is fabulous Madeline Island ferry boat. So in order to get to Madeline Island, you arrive in Bayfield, which is a port town, and you hop on a small car ferry uh, that takes you on a 20 minute ride across to Madeline Island. Um, what we're looking at behind the ferry boat is the M Bayfield Marina, and you will have a chance to visit Bayfield and some private gardens um, during your week's stay with us on Madeline Island. Um, it's a wonderful place. This is one of the town, this is a town park. 
Um, these are the wonderful beaches that we have that that are the surrounds Madeline Island, these rocky and sandy shorelines of Lake Superior. Um, this is the state park. Uh, this is a, a picture probably from one of the cliff areas. Um, this is typical of what you see on the north shore of the island. Um, these beautiful turquoise waters, if you can believe it, it's fresh water, um, but the water is so incredibly clear. You can see right down to the bottom. This is a walking path in the town park. Um, there is camping facilities available, uh, as well as these um, built boardwalks that go on forever. Um, again, we were talking earlier about the fabulous ferns that we photographed. Um, this is where you find those ferns along this boardwalk um, and other fabulous wildlife. Oh, where's this? This must be the lagoon area in um, on Madeline Island. It looks like maybe an early morning visit. This I, I'm not sure. Did do you know who took this picture, Might Charles? Be black black lock. Sure. Or oh, it is really okay. It might be oh, one of black locks in the look at these fabulous lupins. Well, I think one of you two can take take credit for this picture. I'm sure. Is this yours, Mike? No, Charles. It, it might have been mine. It's fabulous. This is what we're talking about. You know, you've seen these lupins behind Charles, um, but this is this is just stunning. These fields of fields of of purple and blue and 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 all sorts of different colors. Um, these are the lupins that we talk about. This is a Catholic church on the island with fabulous gardens um, that surround it. Um, you can see all sorts of wild flowers that are that are. Um, popping up all over the place. Um, this is wonderful. And it's not uncommon to see these lupins all along the shoreline as well. Um, this is probably a better day, slightly overcast. This is what Mike was talking about it when there's not much sun. Um, you get fabulous shots like this. Is this one of yours, Charles or no. Mike? Mm -mm. Nope, no, it wasn't well, ours. Probably me. Oh, look at that handsome fella. Yeah. Uh, this is Mike on location. It looks like you are actually in the parking lot somewhere. It looks like maybe in Bayfield um, with a student, um, really getting towards uh, hands on, just sort of helping him out. This is a student with us. Um, it looks wonderful. Did she get the shot, Mike? Of course. Of course she did. Everybody that comes with me gets a shot. Okay. <laughs> this is wonderful. This is probably on Madeline Island. Again, um, dressed in layers, getting right up. What kinds of flower is that? Is that a... Poppy, I think. Poppy, I was going to say. I Looks think that's important. Bayfield. I think that's the okay. uh, town park or the uh, city park in Bayfield. Yes, oh, right. I recognize one of the trees there. The, yeah. the flowers okay. are the ones that they grow there. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah, Here we have uh, Charles instructing his students with these flowers. Um, again, really hands-on, small groups um, instruction. It's just so much one-on-one uh, -on -one help with, with getting the shot. And and it looks like in the background, we've got, is that just, you know, students helping students? That's actually Jackie Kramer. In the I thought it might have been. <laughs> And then here you can see the use of tripods that we have our students using. This is on the campus. You can see that's one of our accommodations in the background. A great big smile on Charles's face because he knows that they're getting their shot. You're spinning the camera on that one, I think. Oh, uh, look at this fern fiddlehead. Looks amazing. Um, who took this? Does anyone want to take credit for that one? That's mine. I was going to say, you put the background in there, too. No, that's one of the rare ones that I didn't put a background behind. Oh, <laughs> oh look at this. This is yours. Did you yeah. put the background in this one? Um, that was actually sun sun backlighting it. That's why it's glowing like it is. And um, the um, it was the area that was behind it was about 30 feet away, and it was in a dark area, so it just blacked out because that amazing. sun by creating that brightness on the subject with the exposure. Uh, it's trying to get the proper exposure on the on the plant. And then it kind of darkens down to get the proper exposure on the uh, plant and it, it blacks out the background. 
I never thought a fern could look so good. That wow. was actually shot on the campus. Tell us about it. The one on the campus? Uh, no, the shot. What? It's a lupin. Oh, this isn't mine. Oh, it's not. But it no. is a lupin. Yeah. It's gorgeous. I think this one was mine. Oh, wow. Tell us about the day. It was a perfect, soft, bright, overcast day and no wind. So able to use that shallow depth of field here. Just unbelievable, the colors. This is another garden I hope we go to. Uh, there's some old trucks that you can do abstract macro in this location. And uh, he's got daisies and lupin together. So that's a multiple exposure there, of course. Mm -hmm. Sue, I this think that's is... uh, Yes, that's one of mine. Uh, not taken on Madeline Island because I haven't been there, but this is very much the kind of thing I like to do with a very shallow depth of field. And um, if we do get any rain while we're there, raindrops are most one of the most fun things to use on flowers, I think. So we won't be deterred by rain. We'll be rushing out as soon as it stops. Oh, that's mine too. Uh, just a real close-up of a dandelion seed head. Um, they're very, I mean, in England, they're considered weeds, dandelions, really. And it, it always surprises me that with a macro lens, you can find a photograph in something that other people would kind of just put the lawnmower over. Um, it, the most common flower, the most common weed, if you look at it closely with a macro lens, you can find beauty in it. And I always, that's something I really, really enjoy always about this kind of photography. Oh, that one's mine. Um, I think that was a lens baby, but it could have been a Helios. Um, they all start kind of looking similar after a while. So, and um, yeah, some, that was taken in my home actually. And one of my, I have plant a ton of the Cosmos. They're one of my favorite favorite flowers to photograph and they bloom all all um all summer long into fall and uh, they have that lovely fern like foliage on them so i like to do shoot throughs where i can get some of the foliage in there back up a little bit it's not a super close photo but um i'm doing a lot more of that with the bokeh and the backgrounds and incorporating you know whatever's there and using it as a shoot through it's one of my favorite ways to shoot and that, that I believe was a Helios and that might've been my reverse, but I'm not, I can't remember actually, <laughs> but um, another where I do the late, what I explained before, I like to go out when it's almost sunset and get these kind of moody shots. And um, if the light is shining just right, you'll get bokeh in there. So it's one of my favorite things to look for. And that about wraps it up. Um, I just want to remind everyone, you know, there are a couple spots left. Um, you, what you what you heard today was just a little glimpse of what you will get for the entire week that you are with us on Madeline Island from June 17th to the 21st. Um, again, you can go on to Madeline Art, madelineschool.com and register. Um, I think each one of these photographers uh, have the link on their websites as well. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all. Um, thank you so much for everyone for joining us and taking some time out of your Saturday. And most importantly, thank you to Mike, Jerry, Sue, and Charles for taking time to give us some answers to our questions about, most importantly, it seems like the lenses and the tripods and what to pack. You know, those are all questions that I think everyone is always dying to hear. Um, but again, your answers, at, you know, come and join us on this workshop and, and you'll get even more information than what you did today. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Any last words of advice, you guys? Get out and shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't yeah. wait to see you. Enjoy the day with your camera. Yeah. Even if you don't come away with something, being out there is where, where it's really at, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Okay. Everyone take care. Enjoy the eclipse and the basketball game today. <laughs>
Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank you.